This is really a difficult task here. So here, uh, again, disclosures. Uh, I do work with co uh, companies. Everybody does, does here in this minefield with G&G, Globus, and Joymax. Uh, and uh, uh, we try to make this as, as, as uh, neutral as possible. Now, I'll be a little bit quick, and I think uh, I will just go quickly over the background and, and, and the, the thinking and the reasoning why we do all of this, why we go to such extents to do MIS and endoscopic spine surgery. And I'll be a little bit fast and just point out because in, in, in the interest of time. So this is a slide I think is really important uh, and that we collected that in the state of Washington and we're looking at the readmission rates of patients uh, in the state of Washington and I, th I think Swedish is one of those bars here too, uh, University of Washington, everything else. And what you see there right now is, is really that the rate of readmission, so patient has surgery and has to go back to the hospital, differs by a factor of 10. If you would be a car company and producing something like that, and that is your variation in product, you know, like what you produce, you would be out of business the next day. But that's kind of what we have in healthcare right now. So hospitals have very, very, very different outcomes. And what we, can we do as surgeons to, to, to make a difference? And here are the factors that sort of contribute to that variation is the patient, you know, how sick are they? What referral patients do you have? Inpatient treatment, uh, perioperative management, and this invasiveness of the procedure, and outpatient treatment. Um, and really, as you all could sort of imagine, I mean, the, the point that we can really talk about here, the, the, where we can make a difference to minimize those uh, you know, readmission rates and outcome differences is really sort of the invasiveness of our procedure. And uh, the data really comes from Dr. Goodkin, uh, the late Dr. Goodkin, who looked at, uh, did make an, made an index and really sort of looking at open traditional surgery. And he put together this invasiveness index, which is really helpful. And, and uh, Dr. Chapman here, who is here right now, actually he's not here today, but he works here at this institution, uh, then put a very nice paper together where he, pro he showed that um, invasiveness, you know, so how much, uh, tissue destruction and how big is your surgery is really correlates with uh, uh, four complications in four and five out of six organ systems is depending how invasive your procedure is. And so I would like to take this data, again, I'll be quick here. Uh, I just wanted to plant this seed for you and so say that, you know, can I prove that endoscopic is better than MIS? No, but we cannot even prove that MIS is better than open anyway. But I think there's a, a there's a, a tendency here and there's good data proving that in the end of the day, it's better to accomplish the same result with less tissue destruction and less invasiveness. I think there's very, very solid data for that. And I would any, challenge anybody to challenge me on that. Um, and then here's another thing is the big surgeries that we all do, and this is a case that I inherited from here. Um, uh, you know, the big cases we do, most of them had previous surgeries. And, you know, a big surgeries typically need to big, lead to big revision surgeries. Um, and I think it's uh, up to us to really develop the next generation of MIS kind of type of procedures. And uh, I've joined uh, with Luke Kim, uh, we've joined the AO and we have uh, f formed the MIS task force and really working um, to standardize these endoscopic and minimally invasive procedures. So we really have a protocol, we really have this common language to talk about. And I don't like definitions typically, um, but I was involved in formulating this one, so I really like this one. So, um, and I just wanna read it because I think it's we really sort of, that's a good sentence. Um, so minimally invasive is a suit of technology dependent techniques and procedures that reduces the local operative tissue damage and the systemic surgical stress enabling earlier return to function, striving for better outcomes to additional techniques. So I would tell you guys that everybody who uses a cell saver in the OR uses minimal invasive technique. Welcome everyone to MIS. Because MIS is really to care about your patient. Um, and that's what it, this is this definition. The other thing is, you know, like, well, we are, you know, so great right now doing endoscopic surgery and 10 years from now, guess what? The next thing will be around the block. Uh, and so it's, an, it's a constant evolution that everybody contributes. And so I think we, shouldn't, we should be very humble. Uh, and so we should set up stuff to develop things. Basic principles um, of, of, of surgery. Uh, basic OR setup, the same as you would do an, a metrics discectomy. Um, same uh, thing, the interlamina approach that you're going to see for the cervical spine in a couple of minutes really uses a traditional uh, approach. And once you see the anatomy, uh, besides the higher resolution and the better control of instruments, there's really not a lot of difference. And the tools are smaller, so you have to be more precise. You can't, you know, you don't have a lot of error uh, where you go. 
Um, there's a couple of things, te technique difference, which I think is beyond this talk a little bit. Um, angulation and approach angle is extremely important. If you, to, if you use the metrics and you do decompressions of the tube, this is very helpful. My MIS surgery has changed totally since I do a lot of endoscopic stuff. It is much more precise. Um, and that helps you because with the endoscope, if you're five millimeters off, you don't see anything. With the metrics tube that is 18 or 22 millimeters, you can still, you know, cheat your way through. And open, you can always put your finger in. <laughs> that was not funny. Uh, and uh, here is different, um, here is different uh, surgical tools. Again, uh, for the interlaminar approach, we have larger endoscopes, we have small endoscopes, and really this, the, the central stenosis endoscope that is roughly 10 millimeters, you know, has advantages and disadvantages, but really you kind of start seeing the same issues you see with the metrics, right? Use a 22 metrics tube, or like tubular, retract tubular retractor, right? Metrics is a trade name, right? I'm sorry, I never said metrics. Uh, and then use a big tube and you, you try to look to the contralateral side, it's gonna be really difficult, right? Use an 18 millimeter tube or 19 millimeter tube, whatever company you use. And then use, you, you look contralateral and suddenly you can really sort of visualize the contralateral side, right? Using a bigger tube is sometimes a disadvantage. And the same is true for the endoscope too. So it's not, it's really that sort of like uh, complex sort of interaction of size versus efficiency that you have to balance. And that's going to shift the more efficient our tools are going to become. But that's what we have right now for interlamina, uh, like a small um, joint Swedish, I'm at the university. Um, and uh, so you can use either an interlamina scope, roughly seven millimeters or larger 10 millimeter scope. Uh, what we see there is, uh, and I just wanted to point that out in the last draw right now, using the targeting that we do there um, and really calculating the approach angle. And you see that in Qi, I can either approach the disc space, the analyst, I can look caudally, S1 nerve root, or I could look rostral with the angle and see the exiting L5 nerve root. And that's just by angling the scope and planning the trajectory, right? If I do this approach and I wanna see the S1 nerve root, guess what, you're out of luck. You know, it's just really difficult to get this. You have to do a little bit of thinking before the cases. And uh, here's a little video, which uh, I'm going to shorten here in, in the interest of time, but this was a 29-year-old uh, female, and the video is obviously not working, awesome. Um, interesting, I probably have so many windows open. Anyhow, here's where we go through the yellow ligament, you see the epidural fat, after the epidural fat, you want to identify the dura. Once you see the dura, it now comes into vision here down there. Then you want to medialize. You want to find the, the lateral aspect of the dura. In this case, you see a disc sequester in the axilla, which is really important to retrieve before you retract the neural elements. Otherwise, you push the neural elements into that resector. So we take that little sequester out. Again, then everybody's like, oh. And then everybody, nobody pays attention anymore. But then, you know, really, um, you have to go down there and find the traversing S1 nerve root, find the analyst, and then this is probably the only really brilliant thing about this. Everything else is just, you know, whatever, you know. But, but this move here is most brilliant, that um, you can put your working tube in there and rotate it around, and then you can look at the analyst defect, and you can work there in peace, and you can also drill down osteophytes, and everything is under full control. Here's the, the analyst defect, and so then you can go in there uh, and char the thing out. And, and the, re, at the three months reharnation rate is, is around, I think, 2% with this technology that we have right now in a nationwide sample. Uh, and that's the end of the interlaminate decompression. Um, transforamal that we have seen, right? Sorry. I try to find a tear and then you go into the disc and, and, and remove it. That's, that's a very controversial topic. Some people, a lot of Germans only like to take the sequester and don't even like to go to the tear. Um, I've been burned twice where I didn't do that and then have a floating piece in the analyst, a, a loose fragment. And so I always like to go in there and, and make sure that I retrieve the loose fragments so that in the end of the day, you have like a three by three, three millimeter cavity that you char out. Um, I think that's something that needs to be studied. We just don't know. Uh, we know that um, in the 20 years ago in the US, people were cleaning out the entire disc and put a gold fragment on top. 
Now, obviously, no insurance company would pay for the gold fragment anymore. But even if you do something cheap, people get like really bad back pain with that. And so we don't do that anymore. So it's a compromise. I think it's your, uh, I even sort of sometimes involve the patient in the decision making. Be like, hey, do you want me to be more aggressive, take out more disc with a lower rate of reherniation? Or do you want me to just, you know, take it out with a higher risk, relieving, keeping more of a disc? It's, I think it's a, you can discuss with the patient. Transforaminal approach we saw right now, I don't think there's a lot to add. Um, our transforaminal technique that we have developed with the AO and the University of Washington is a little bit different in that, that we really um, more and more use the SAP, the superiority process to access. You see the low, lower two, two images. It's at L4, 5, which is much, much more simple than L5, S1. So again, uh, Gan, kudos to you. What you did in there was just beyond amazing. So I um, couldn't do it. So, but we do that, we go through it. We take down the S superiority process and that's where the, where the cannulas sits. Um, I just find this much easier to, to teach uh, and also to get uh, landmarks. So my, my transforaminal landmarks are the uh, pedicle, the SAP. Um, again, the pedicle, this is always the cherry shot on the right side. Uh, I know that my ventropostal orientation is perfect. I see the pedicle, I see the traversing nerve root. All the anatomical landmarks are crystal clear. Uh, and Dan has done a couple of cases with me as my fellow right now here. At, he was at the university and Sahib is joining afterwards. So Dan, is that what we do every transfer animal case? Good, you can pick up your $20 afterwards. Um, and, um, and then here is, um, you know, like what you see, again, the pedicle on the left side the SAP, and then in the middle you see the nerve root. And what we have started to do here is, um, here you just see the, the, uh, the drilling in the frame in there, um, where you take down the SAP. And again, you don't have to do that in every case, but we do that in order to teach a technique that works for everything. And then like uh, Gan showed you, for like a healthy patient that has a, chick, a big fan of foramen and a disc herniation, you obviously don't have to do that. But that's a technique that you can always do. Um, and another thing we added to that is intraoperative monitoring because our people sleep. Um, in the US, we have roughly you know, 10 to 15, 15 anesthesiology providers per case uh, with breaks and like rotations, at least two, three people talking up there. I've done a couple of uh, awake patients and they just don't understand, is it my break? Is it your break? Who goes on break? It was just, they get super confused. So it was, uh, they sleep and everybody has coffee. It's perfect. Um, and so for that reason, you will use monitoring. Uh, here we did a paper on that, not important. Clinical outcomes, and honestly, right now, Jeff, if I can just show you this slide, and you can interrupt me anytime. This is the only important thing, and, and because it's important, it's actually not from me. This is from Dr. Roger Hartle, and I give him all the credit because this explains everything. Not everything, but it explains a little bit. Uh, so if you look at this right now, at the complexity and the invasiveness, right? The open traditional surgery is the red line, and the green line is the minimal invasive surgery or whatever you want to kind of call minimal invasive. And really what it does is, you know, you can use, you can take care of the same complexity surgery and have less invasiveness. And again, we heard at the beginning of the talk that invasiveness is really correlated to complications and to outcome, right? So we can take that invasiveness down a notch by being minimal invasive surgeons. And you know, I'm sure we're going to have this discussion again later today. I'm looking very much forward to that. Well, you know, if I do a discectomy, you know, my patients do great. You know, Dr. Hofstetter, you do endoscopic. You know, I can do it with pliers. I can do it with a spoon. And it's just my patients do great. And I want to tell you, good for you. And also that there's actually a paper that there's no difference if you use loops or microsurgical technique. So. Maybe the next paper should be, you can stand on one leg and close one eye, and you can still do a discectomy. Um, using microsurgical technique versus minimal invasive technique, no difference. Now, this was a very flawed trial. The surgeon has no experience that participated in that. A lot of issues. What I want to, the reason I bring this up here right now is, you know, even for minimal invasive surgery, there is really no class one data to support that. Now, we all know what we would do if, if it's our disc, right? And there's good data up there, and it kind of supports this a little bit. Uh, this is from Dr. Rutten, who is in Germany, and he did put this study together. And I just wanted it down there. He compared uh, minimally invasive with endoscopic discectomies. And really, you know, the, the outcome was very similar. The only main difference was, uh, you know, more patients suffered from progressive back pain after the minimally invasive surgery. 
And that was significant. Um, and that's something that we really kind of start seeing right now is it just be, being more gentle to the tissue and resecting less bone, I think gives you a better outcome. And for sure, and I'll show you the data, nationwide in the US, you know, uh, a combined uh, study group has, sh we have actually had a paper submitted right now with those data that it's better. Can you go back to that slide? Yeah. So, so the um, patients with microscopic versus endoscopic stuff and more progressive back pain, can you explain the sort of theory behind that? So what I, again, and again, you know, Rutten doesn't really go into that, but what we have seen in our patients is the the, the degree of parse fractures after discectomies or, or MIS lamis is, you know, there's no data on that, but at least in my patient population is right between two, three, four percent parse fractures people that develop instability after tubular decompression uh, and that need surgery, uh, that they become destabilized. Um, and really the, the reason why people need more surgery is because they, they don't protect the exiting nerve root in the foramen. Um, and that's much more important than I think we give it credit to right now. So I think uh, we have actually no language to describe foramen stenosis, no language. Foramen stenosis, I mean, read a neuro radiology report, there's nothing on it, right? If it is, you're lucky if they mention it, right? But is it from ligament? Is it from subluxation of the SAP, buckling of the ligament from a grade one slip? Is the vertebral body involved? Can you decompress, decompress it indirectly, directly? We don't have, even have the words for that right now. But that's what determines if they do well or not. So I think very interesting. Um, and I think there's a trend towards that. And uh, I think there's now a really ample uh, scientific evidence of decent papers that you can see, including our own study from, uh, again, from a study group from the US with more than 500 patients. I can now say with confidence that, who, you know, patient satisfaction is important, of course, but there's really a trend and a significant trend towards fewer complications with endoscopic spine surgery. The outcomes may be the same, but the complication rate is different. And so now we come up there. It's like, okay, so discs, you know, my outcomes are the same. Sure, the outcomes are the same. You know, I can use a plier, I can use a, you know, like kitchen knife, I can pull out the disc fragment, you will have your reticulopathy, if you pull out the fragment, it's going to be gone, obviously. Um, but what about if you go up on the complexity now? So let's do a laminectomy, for example, it does it make more of a difference. So, you know, you guys over here see the 25 year old guys with, uh, uh, you know, commercial insurance, I see the guys with BMI of 60. Okay, so welcome to the university. Uh, came to me, super nice guy, four level stenosis, you see that every level you know, uh, a canal that is like congenital and narrow, BMI of, of 60, like super big. Um, and, and that's his outcome uh, down there, like pain, leg pain of 10. He was in a wheelchair at that point. And then he started to lose his bladder function when I stopped negotiating with his insurance. Um, I just took him to the OR. Um, and that's an intraoperative uh, picture up there. This is a 14 centimeter long tube that sticks in there, 14 centimeters to the hub. If you do the surgery, even if you're a big surgeon with big hands, you can't reach. Our president could never do the surgery. Never. He would just he would just go to the fascia. He would be down there, like no problem. It would not work. So, but again, a big surgeon with big hands, he could maybe do it. Um, but the hub hurt. You know, this this really helps you. So you go down there and you can decompress. And again, once you're inside, it's just there's no difference. So I mean, for morbidly obese patients, and please don't send me any of those. But 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 it really it suddenly it doesn't matter anymore, right? Because you're working. Your cameras are there. Your tools are there. It really doesn't matter. And so those are the outcomes. He's 12 months out, he's lost a bunch of weight. Is he perfect? No, but he's like, you see the outcome scores, like left leg pain, four, right side, two, he's out of the wheelchair, and he works again in a bank, and he can take care of his family, his two wonderful daughters, and he's a happy camper. And I, I, you know, I promise you, we couldn't have done this without this technology. So does it make a difference? I think yes. And then the other thing is, you know, this is a post-operative MRI on a patient that we did. And look at the surgical canal, a surgical corridor. This is where we decompressed. And this is nice, right? We don't take down the facet joint. Um, I think nobody would go to an orthopedic surgeon telling them that, yeah, you have to have your meniscus repaired, but I have to take half of your knee down. Is that okay? You're fine. Well, so you still have half of it. Half of your knee is still good. It's two sides. So with the endoscope, you can really work around the corners. So I think you know, we'll see, and again, we don't have long-term data on this, but I think in the end of the day, we will be able to show that there's more structural integrity of these de decompression surgeries. Uh, with other words, these patients are going to need fewer follow-up surgeries, and in the end of the day, a huge cost saving for society. 
which we need anyhow. So, and here's data again from uh, from this technique uh, from Rutten. Um, again, very similar outcome to uh, to the open surgeries, and again, uh, more progressive back pain. Very very similar to to the discectomy study from Rutten too. And here's the, the data from, uh, from our institution that we submitted here right now. So we did uh, 96 consecutive patients, either MIS or endoscopic, uh, all different type of levels, uh, in particular one and two levels, obviously. One thing that includes the uh, learning time, you can see that the endoscopic surgeries were much, much longer than open surgeries. So now, um, and Dan can attest to that, I think for an, one level Lamy bit down from beginning four hours now to a little bit more than an hour roughly to a one level Lamy with the endoscope. Uh, and I think it's, it's continues with, with new development and new tools that you can see over there. It, really, the times are coming down dramatically. Uh, so the times were longer, and the hospital stay was obviously much shorter for endoscopic patients. Typically, the, my endoscopic patients are gone before I start my next surgery. Um, but that might be hospital dependent. Um, Jeff, what do you think about the 2.4 days for the MIS patients? That seems pretty small. Uh, you know, a lot of these. Yes, uh, so I mean, on average, they go, the median is one day, they go on the next morning, typically. Uh, it's just a lot of these patients are just sick to the bones. Most of them have transplants. Most of them are old. Uh, you know, it's like, it's a Medicare population. So, uh, uh, you know, I'm glad that nobody died from this patient population. So, um, it, they're very sick patients. So, um, and again, you see that with endoscope, a, a, a good proportion of these patients goes home the same day, despite all of that. Um, so even like a, you know, typically patients older than 70 years old, I like to keep them in a hospital overnight. It's just, just to give them a little bit of, you know, care around the procedure. But um, I think we, you know, for a normal, like a, a younger patient population, they can all go home the same day. All right, and here's the outcome. So um, in our sample, at least, uh, with the endoscopic decompressions, we actually get um, superior outcomes at a year uh, compared to MIS. Uh, and I think that's, uh, due to technical issues that we can, you know, again, beyond that talk, but I think it's just more thorough surgery. Uh, you know, you see nerve structures better, and you can really decompress them individually, exiting nerve root, traversing nerve root. It gives you superior visualization and technique. And I think that's why between the MIS decompressions using tubular systems and the endoscopic surgeries, both the VS and the ODIs were significantly better at one year. And I, I again, we don't have proof for that, but my, uh, my take on this is that you just have a better quality of decompression of neural elements. All right, and then just to sum up here right now, um, so what is the, the cases that you can really, you know, even the laminectomies, you can argue about it, but I think these cases, you really can't argue that this technology is really of great benefit to the patients. So we looked at patients who had previous uh, fusion surgery and then sort of by having issues with their fusion surgery, developed radiculopathy, and radiculopathy either because the fusion construct subsided or that they had issues adjacent to it. Um, and um, the adjacent level decompression is frustrating and not very good. So having a, a patient who has a one level fusion surgery and for ML stenosis right next to it, uh, odds are if you do a decompression endoscopically that they come back within a year are very high. So adjacent level decompression is it doesn't have a very good rate. I think like 50, 60% of these patients needed more arthrodesis surgery. So once you've bought into the arthrodesis, you can have to almost stick to it. Now, what's really a home dunk and, and home run with these patients is, is, is really, if you have stenosis within a success, successful fusion construct, that's really very good, good outcomes. So if somebody is fused, they subside either cervical or, or lumbar, but they compress the nerve root and it's fused to open up that foramen you have fantastic outcomes, which are obviously durable because once the nerve is in enough space, there's nothing that's going to change. And that's why we showed there were like three patients and they all really did fantastic after this outcome, after this procedure. Another thing is, you know, you can resect uh, some, you know, displaced uh, cages and other stuff. I've, I've resected olive cages, t lift cages. Uh, I've resected, the, uh, you know, the, the interspinous process devices, uh, anything, all these fun hardware that you can resect. Uh, it's, it's really, uh, there's no limit to, to the fantasy here. Um, and the good thing is you typically don't have to take everything down. So these patients come in, you take it out, they go home. Um, and then uh, complications quickly. Uh, I guess I should not skip that. So that's the paper I talked about. Um, that's our, uh, uh, our study group, uh, all spread out of the US endoscopic spine surgeons that we have here. We treated 553 endoscopic surgeries. Uh, I just want to point out your attention there. Durotomy rate was like 0.7%. 
uh, compared to MIS literature, 1.1 1, uh, 1 .1 to 14 percent. Um, epidural hematoma is actually quite comparable with uh, MIS and open and recurrent disc herniations. Again, the difference is here, this is only three months, so a, a little caution there. So, but definitely uh, it looks favorable uh, for these te this technology. Uh, here's different techniques, how to repair a dural tear, uh, uh, which we described in this paper, how to take care of a bleed, so how to do that, and then some conclusions. So um, I think uh, this technology helps us to further minimize the invasiveness of our standard surgical procedures. I think uh, the advantage is it can, in some cases, replace procedures with a higher invasiveness index. Um, it helps us to manage patients with multiple comorbidities and keep the uh, complication rate nice and low. I think there is a need for novel imaging and diagnostic methods. Uh, we have to develop more efficient tools, which I think we have been really good the last couple of years at. Um, and uh, we have um, developing right now surgical technique guides with the AO, so we all speak the same language. And if you talk about trans-SAP, trans approaches, we all know what we're talking about, right? And if you talk about interlaminar approaches, we know what the landmarks are, we will know what the goals of the surgery. So the AO is going to come out with a detailed 10-step procedure list for all of this, these procedures. And it should be done by the end of the year to do that. And then we have established our first endoscopic spine fellowship, and Sahib is back there, and he is going to join us in September, and he will join a, be a year with me, and we'll just uh, make him the best endoscopic spine surgeon in the country. Thank you. That's it.